Hey, my working out. I can hear you, Joe. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Hi there, I see Joe, Christina, Karen, and Karen. I think we're waiting on a couple of people. Hold on, Peter. Kathleen Stowe, do you see me? Okay, now I see you. Thank you. All right, we'll give it a minute or two. It's just seven o'clock. We'll just give it another minute. I think I was just on the uh, the planning and zoning meeting, and I know Tony's there, Sean is there, uh, Dan Watson's over there. That should they'll probably drop and join us. Sounds good. Tony told me that she would be leaving the planning and zoning committee meeting and then come up, so she'll be ready. Thanks, Anne. Okay, I see Peter's on. We're just waiting on Megan. Oh, there she is. All right, looks like we are all eight here. So with that, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I will call this meeting to order. Uh, Mike, if you wouldn't mind sharing the flag for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, look at that. We're going fancy tonight, folks. All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, so before we move on to approve the meeting agenda, this is Peter Bernstein. Uh, I wanna thank you for joining what is now our second virtual Board of Education meeting. Uh, before we start, I'm gonna run through a couple of items that uh, hopefully will help us out and the public that's listening. Um, if you heard me say this last time, I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure we do that. Uh, the agenda for the meeting can be found on our board doc site. You can get to that by going to greenwichschools.org, uh, clicking on the Board of Education link, scrolling down to meetings, and then you'll be taken over to board docs and you'll just look for today's date. Uh, this meeting is being conducted virtually pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order 7B. So per the order, we're going to record the meeting. We'll be posting it on our webpage and our YouTube channel. Yes, the Greenwich Public Schools YouTube channel. Uh, well loved. Um, so this is a special meeting. Uh, we're not doing public comments tonight. 
Uh, but anybody that wants to send an email and comment to the board can send an email to all of the all of the BOE members by sending a single email to Board of Ed members at greenwich.k12.ct.us. Uh, the meeting tonight is going to consist of discussion by and among the superintendent, her team, board members, and some external consultants. I'd ask you to please stay on mute when you're not speaking. Uh, and I'm going to ask participants to state their name when they do speak. We need to do that for the, uh, for the record and under the executive order. Uh, we're going to be using the raise the hand function, although, Michael, you might have to help me with that because I'm not sure I can see it. Um, and I'd ask board members to try to keep their comments concise so that we can keep things moving along. Uh, if we have to vote on any items, which we're going to do in a second to approve the agenda, I'm going to have to do it as a roll call vote. So just please wait until your name is spoken. Uh, with that, can we get a motion to approve the meeting agenda? Just need a, a member to so unmute. Moved. So moved, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Is there a second? I'll so. second that. No, Karen Hirsch. Well, Karen's keeping the minutes, so she'll judge who, who got there first. All right, so uh, any discussion on the meeting agenda? Hearing none. Uh, I'm an aye. Kathleen? Aye. Karen Hirsch. Aye. Christina Downey. Uh, aye. Joe Kelly. Aye. Karen Kowalski. Aye. Uh, Meg Megan Olson. Aye. And Peter Chair. Peter, I think you might still be muted. No. Okay, Peter's a no. All right, that passes 7-1. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Kathleen so, Stowe. Yeah, I heard Kathleen and uh, Christina, do you want to be the I'll second? Sec I'll second, thank you. All right, uh, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, I'd be a yes, Kathleen? Yes. Karen Hirsch? Yes. Christina? Yes. Joe? Yes. Karen Kowalski? Yes. Megan? Yes. Peter Scher? Yes. Okay, we've approved our consent agenda. Uh, next up are discussion items, superintendent's update, and Dr. Jones, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, I, just tonight's update is really just kind of the whole coronavirus again. That was one of the reasons, well, that was really the reason that we put this meeting on tonight, just to make sure the board stays um, in touch with what's happening in the district. So on Friday, late Friday, I did notify you about the bus situation. I think everybody is aware um, that the bus contract, um, they decided, SDA decided to uh, stop their bus depot in Greenwich. So we worked over the weekend to be able to continue to find a solution to get us through delivering breakfast and lunch. Um, we're grateful to TAG who picked up two days of breakfast that previously we were doing. So they're doing all five mornings for us now with our staff delivering breakfast. And then we worked with CES, who is our cooperative educational services partner out of Trumbull. And they uh, organized drivers and um, Norwalk, some Norwalk SUVs um, to be able to deliver for us. So that was a huge help so that we didn't have any glitch whatsoever or, or take up all of your offers to run pickup trucks and cars, which we would have, we would have had food today regardless, but it was great to have a solution um, by today so that we know we can sustain it. Um, and with our lunches, just an update where we were last week and where we are today. And I, I honestly think this is such, a, such an important piece of everything that we're doing now because our lunches and breakfast have gone from about 1,000, went up to 1,200, 1,400. Um, as, if you've been reading in the news, uh, neighbor to neighbor continues to grow as well. We do have a lot of um, families that are due to disability right now. So this is, this is important. And also thank you to the volunteers in town who have uh, gathered school supplies. The Alliance did paper and pencils and colored pencils and followed the bus and delivered some of those. We have a whole nother group of parents right now who are doing um, another delivery. And then we also have um, the library has some books they're going to be donating um, to different sites so children have more access to books. And that's all at those, um, those food stops. So um, doing a lot of great kind of community effort there. 
I think the biggest thing on everybody's mind still that's weighing heavy is what is the length of the closure? Um, we were told that we would definitely have a little bit more information uh, by Friday. Today, the commissioner did announce he's doing a conference on Thursday, right at the very end of the day. So if we know something, it'll be probably between anywhere from two to five o'clock. Um, and we're hoping that they'll give us more direction. Is it another month? Is it the rest of the year? And we really don't have any idea right now. They're watching um, what they call the curve of the virus, what's happening in the hospitals, and also what's happening uh, even with the schools. Because if they were going to open us in a tighter position, which is how, where we were right before we went out. If you remember, we were deep cleaning our buildings every night uh, for about two weeks. None of the school districts have the capacity to do that right now because we don't have the mask and the protective uh, equipment for our own custodial staff. So that is also something that they will need to problem solve as they're looking at reopening school districts. Um, one of the probably the greatest uh, areas where we really have a need right now, and it is it is what we're going to call phase two, part of that phase two focus is going to be on the social emotional health. And that's not only for our students, um, but our staff as well. We know a lot of our families um, are really struggling. And, you know, we talk a lot in education and I put it in one of our notes to staff the other night um, about Maslow before Bloom and that really is we have to make sure that children um, and our young people are first of all fed that they have basic needs and the second level is really they're very scared we have a lot of really nervous um, and the board i know has seen a few emails even just from students um, where it's it's a scary time for young people and for staff and families um, so we are really working on that and along with that um, the state is seeing that our uh, department of child and family services calls and and, um, and our reports are down by 30 percent or more and that's a concern because that means a lot of our children we would have picked up um, in school that were really having challenges we're not seeing that right now so um, we're trying to make sure again just that whole personal connection with children and families it, it's hard when you don't get to see them every day the other thing is we know we have some domestic abuse and that is in Greenwich as well it's going up um, across the state so there's just so many, there are a lot of issues that are really important and critical for health and safety. And, you know, last week, I know um, Mr. Kelly was helping to work on uh, with our coaches and reaching out about doing some virtual competitions and, and what can we do to put some fun back in our students' um, lives. And so we're working on that right now as well, not just coaches, uh, everything from virtual chess. Um, those of you who have been watching, the police department actually started the bear hunt which is based on a book called the bear hunt a children's book and people all over town have been putting bears in their windows and that just allows family if they're going to go walk around the block or walk around their neighborhood to do something fun together or to drive around in their car um, and, and look for all the bears in the window so that's going to be a big focus for us is making sure we're doing as much as we can for social emotional health uh, we're constantly updating our website we have um, quite a bit of new information on there right now it's easier now to see what an elementary template looks like, what the middle school schedule looks like, high school schedule. Um, they are, they're following their A day or their B day. So those are the classes that are communicating and when content is posted. Um, we also have a lot of our staff, um, we were surveying at the end of last week, a lot of our staff are utilizing uh, video um, and they are utilizing Zoom and utilizing uh, Google Meets. Zoom is still where uh, we have some parents that are actually starting to reach out more now about they're very concerned, even in small groups with Zoom because New York's not allowing it because the attorney general has uh, come out and said they're looking at Zoom. Um, the thing with Zoom in Connecticut is Connecticut did open the door a little bit when they signed the pledge doesn't mean that they're fully compliant for K-12, uh, but they signed a data privacy pledge and they also tightened up their data privacy about a week ago uh, on the back end so that information is not automatically going over to Facebook right now. So we have a mixture of what teachers are use, using, but they're really work, uh, working to reach out you know, on a personal level to families. I will say on that issue, um, when we talk about FERPA and privacy issues, we just got um, a memo tonight from the commissioner's office, but I didn't get it until six o'clock and I was on the planning and zoning uh, Zoom meeting, but it, they're providing more guidance 
So will that allow us to do more or less? I can't weigh in yet, but um, they're really taking all of these questions from around Connecticut because we all have the same concerns. And at the top of the memo, it actually says this document is basically, it's gonna be a live document because it can change uh, on a daily basis. But once I read that, I'll be able to perhaps provide more information even on the FERPA issues and some of the challenges we've had with um, live for public schools. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much, I think most of the components of what, what's happening right now. And it changes on a daily basis. Michael, I don't know, do we have uh, raise your hand enabled? I'm not sure how that works on, on this platform. It is enabled. Uh, Kathleen still has her hand up right now, if you see right. that. Kathleen, go ahead. I was just testing. Kathleen Stowe, Board of Ed, just testing you. No, seriously, thanks, Tony, for the update. Um, I think that it sounds like we'll know more on Thursday, right, if we're, if this is going to be an extended closure or not. Um, I sense many of us expect it'll go past April 20th, which is probably the reality. Um, and so as we get used to our new normal, I think the, real, the reality is that we need to get better at this every week, right, distance learning every week. And it seems that we have. I look at where we were, was it really four weeks ago? Somehow time is flying for me. Um, I know people don't want to hear that. but. <laughs> Um, so it seemingly is getting better every week. Obviously I live it here every day. Um, but as I talk to people, some of the consistent themes we're continuing to hear, right, is more live instruction, right? More, and, but small groups. And I think that's key. And I think that's what we have been doing. And we seem to be rolling out more and more of that. Um, potentially office hours, potentially one-on-one -on -one conferences. I'm seeing all elements of this, right? And and then everyone seems to be, or not everyone, but a lot of teachers seem to be recording lectures, definitely more instead of the middle school and high school level. Do we, what would you say the balance should be between those things as, and maybe I'm asking this question too early, but as we go each week, should we be trying to increase a, to a certain level as our goal to sort of give teachers options so we have some live versus on-demand recordings versus office hours? It's hard to sort of do all of it. And maybe we give both students and teachers flexibility by giving those options. But those are sort of the recurring themes we're hearing. And I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it will continue to be a multitude of options simply based off, but number one, what the teacher has at home, what their capability is, what content area they teach. Um, one thing we're hearing even from our elementary teachers, it's really hard to for instance, to do some smaller literacy lessons that they would like to do perhaps even um, for students because they don't have their materials. So if this closure goes longer um, from an administrative standpoint, we know that, it, for instance, let's say it's the rest of the year, we will have some days where our buildings are open so that teachers can come in and get some books and things that they didn't have before. So that will make it a little easier. Um, our goal really this, this last week and a bit has been, we, we really want you to be personal with children. Uh, we want you to do a video if that's where you have to start to welcome in the morning, you know, morning meeting, uh, doing small groups, and there's a lot of that going on. And I would say in special education is where we tend to see more of our service providers doing some one-on-one -on -one with parent consult. The parents know um, they're doing it. And we've had some parents that have said, no, they're not interested in that. Um, also, I would say as many are saying no as they're saying yes. Um, some people are just nervous about if they've been watching the news um, for little ones. They don't uh, want children necessarily on those platforms. Um, the FaceTime is it's wonderful for things like speech. Um, so I, I think we'll continue to see it grow as people are more comfortable. That's that's a big piece of it. And yeah, no, that's that's a, you're right. And you do and I've seen successful small groups and and ones that haven't gone as well. So I could and you have to remain flexible because not everyone has the same schedule. All right, that's very helpful. Thank you. All right, Megan, I see your hand is up. Unmute myself. Um, thank you, Tony. I, um, my question is more about, I, I guess Kathleen alluded to, alluded to it as well as the consistency of the platforms we're using um, for video conferencing. I know that um, uh, a lot of schools are saying they're sort of requiring, it takes some of the flexibility away from the teachers as some of their choice away, which isn't always a great thing, but they're saying, okay, like in the Bronx and certain schools in Westchester, they're saying we require in Google Classroom and Google Meet as our venue. I know where I am in Lexington, um, we, they've said, okay, we're not using Zoom, but everybody can do this using Google Meet, Google Hangout, two office hours required a week for 
whether it's live chat or be able to answer questions live in real time. Um, so the teachers still have the flexibility on the time, but I think that in some ways it might be a good idea to give a little bit more structure as to what to use because otherwise, um, I think while everyone's kind of figuring it out, it feels like it, it becomes sort of a hodgepodge and then there's not necessarily always consistency from school to school, from grade to grade, from teacher to teacher. Um, is that a possibility? And I'm, I'm not even something that, something that maybe, um, uh, you know, it doesn't always, it, something that can even be building to building, I suppose. But I do think that it's beneficial to have that, have one message come directly from central office if that's possible. Yeah, we, we do have a guidance document that went out to all the staff uh, that was created about, I want to say three weeks ago, sent it out again on Sunday evening, just with some more updates. Um, when I get the updates from, when I read the, the memo that came at six o'clock tonight, it may provide more because I was on the planning and zoning, I couldn't really read it, but I think they do address the whole Zoom issue a little bit because um, you know, should it be shut down or do we keep it open when they, what they sent us out last week was celebratory that they had signed the pledge. Uh, but that was before New York, I think came out and shut it down. So, um, I need to go in and see what they've advised us tonight. And if they advise us that we shouldn't be using zoom, um, then we'll, you know, we'll go in that direction. We do have Google meets as part of our actual educational suite, um, that we, that we have available. And, you know, we, and we do have staff that are using both. And part of it is to even with our, um, our LMS, you know, makes it a little tricky. And I know I mentioned this last time, but uh, we have part of our teachers are on Google and part are on Schoology. Um, and Schoology has been a real challenge for those of you that have had children on Schoology. It has really been glitchy uh, the last really two weeks. Um, I haven't heard yesterday or today, so maybe it's getting better. Um, but that's, those are things we're evaluating. After I see what guidance I have tonight, I may have a clearer idea of what the, what the state's going to recommend. Are they going to change directions um, in Connecticut with Zoom as well? Can I just jump in one more time? I think that'd be, um, no, I think that's helpful. I think it's also just, um, and I'm the first to admit like how difficult it is with children running around the house trying to, trying to teach live lessons, trying to you know, reach out um, directly to each individual student. So I, I definitely get all that. I just feel like even if everyone was doing, let's say that you did go in the direction of Google Meets or something, um, you know, there are so many, you know, 15 minute, five minute, seven minute little videos. Like I've taught myself Screencastify, Google Meets. Like there's so many things that we can just, even on our own time, even 11 at night as educators, once the kids are asleep, like figure something out and learn something. And I know that our educators are doing that. But I just feel like a clear, and maybe this will come with like restrictions on Zoom or whatever, but a clear direction for sort of a clear general, a clear direction um, might make it easier for everyone to be sort of aligned. Thank you. And, and, and I know your district took a really unusual uh, viewpoint for the technology aspect. And so I really respected learning um, more about that. That was very different um, than what, especially than what people here in Connecticut are doing. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, we're trying to make sure we're giving flexibility, which is what we really want our teachers to be able to be creative. Um, and like with Screencastify, we have a lot of teachers that are doing a great job with Screencastify. Um, and we're also trying to get some examples on our website right now over the next couple of weeks. So when we say Screencastify, what does that even mean? Because uh, I know I have a lot of parents that probably don't know, um, a lot of families. So we're going to try to get some examples. What it, what is being utilized and what is out there? Thank you. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Tony, so much for you know listening to our feedback and being so communicative with us. Um, I know when you and I have spoken earlier today, you mentioned a possible um, document that you might be able to share um, with us and uh, the community at some point later. So I look forward to seeing that. Um, I also know that we discussed consistency before, um, consistency in delivery in our bricks and mortar classrooms. Um, it's, it's always been different in educator style and personality, but um, with the way we're doing distance learning now, it really has sort of highlighted some of those differences. Um, I think the biggest concern that's been shared with me has been the lack of consistency um, in delivery across grade levels and subject levels. And I'm hoping that we can continue to look for creative solutions if the school closure continues, um, especially as children are going to need the connections with their teachers and interaction with their classmates and ways we can find 
opportunities for that um, going forward. Um, the other question I had for you um, is, I know we also have really not gotten any guidance yet on grading. Um, I know it's top of mind for many students and I'm hoping that we take grade levels into consideration when we're making our own decision. Um, I don't know if it's something that the state will require uh, the whole state to do or not, but if we are able to make those decisions, I hope that um, we especially take the high school levels into consideration where students need, often need their grades and GPA for consideration for college and other program applications. So I don't know if you've gotten any guidance uh, yet or the uh, governor will be discussing that in tomorrow or Thursday's uh, meeting. So we have shared with the, the commissioner that of education that it's critical that we get the state guidance. Most, a lot of the states that closed for the year have already done that. And because almost all of the, especially high schools, have their marking uh, periods ending this week or the week after if they pushed it back. So we have been knocking on their door asking for that guidance. Um, I think, I, I, don't, I don't know, but from listening to my superintendent colleagues, I really think we're hoping that they're going to have local choice for students. So if you're a student who really wanted to keep your grade, because um, there are, I've had high school students that have reached out and said, please don't give me a pass fail. They truly believe it's going to hurt, you know, their transcript. And then I've had parents that have reached out and said, my child's not coping at all, just with the entire situation. They could have people sick at their home. Um, I mean, we hear from families every day that are in some challenging circumstances and the pass fail for some of those children would probably be a huge stress relief. So I'm really, we're expecting on Thursday on this call that we'll get some direction on that. Okay, I really do appreciate that. And um, you know, thank you for again, being so responsive to questions and concerns and, um, and whatever else. Thank you. All right, Mr. Kelly. Tony, thank you for the update. A uh, couple of observations. Uh, I noticed that some of our teachers are absolute rock stars and we should be reaching out to those teachers for the example we did at the Kelly House. Uh, I asked my daughter how it's going, of course, keeping track of, uh, of how, uh, how, how the home situation is working with her. And she pointed out that some teachers are really putting the effort in, the enthusiasm is off the charts and they're really doing well. I suggest to my fellow board members and if we can then spread the word to the rest of the community through our board, that these teachers should be contacted by us, told they're doing a really good job, so that way they pick up their energy and continue to do that good job. We should use these teachers to somehow identify the teachers that are doing the great job, that are the rock stars, and maybe figure out if they could convey what they're doing uh, to make themselves uh, so good to the teachers that might need a little help on getting there. Uh, we understand there's a number of situations which could prevent the uh, uh, teachers from doing uh, outstanding jobs that, due to the situation we're in, but certainly let's try to identify the uh, standout teachers. Um, I'm also noticing we're getting complaints, uh, criticisms, uh, we're getting uh, suggestions uh, from the public, I know I am, and uh, what I would suggest if, uh, uh, if the public is complaining, please with that complaint have a solution because any complaint without a solution really kind of is, a, is a, not really a meaningful correspondence. So please come with solutions, compliments, uh, tell us, uh, express to us what we're doing correctly, and then we can build off that. Uh, as long as we keep moving forward, we'll get better. What the teachers are doing with the kids is great. In a lot of cases, some cases maybe not so much. Uh, Tony, you brought this up before about the coaches. Uh, a lot of the kids count on their uh, students count on their sports season to give them the confidence to move through the school system. Not every kid does well in school, and even the kids that do well in school need more than an A uh, to feel they've accomplished things. This also applies to uh, uh, the clubs and the arts. Uh, we have to make sure we engage our uh, instructors and the clubs, our coaches, uh, and our, uh, our teachers, our music teachers, and uh, our teachers to continue uh, working with the kids so they can, it's not just the academics but it's more of the components uh, that the kids are lacking right now to get them through this tough situation. So that's my, uh, those are my observations. Thank you. All right, Thank anybody you. else? I guess not seeing any hands raised at the moment. Um, Tony, I wanted to ask you about, uh, this is Peter Bernstein again, uh, Flexible Fridays. So I, I've gotten mixed, uh, mixed reactions to it, even in my own house, they call them Freaky Fridays, uh, where they tend to do a lot more couch sitting than they might do otherwise. So wondering, I know this Friday is Good Friday and we're, we're off, but wondering what the thought process is in the future for that. 
Um, once I know this week where we stand, we'll look at the calendar in its totality. Um, let's say we're going to be off for another month. We'll, we'll preset if there's going to be a flex. Is there going to be like April 28th is a professional day. Is that still going to be a professional day, which gives the whole day where teachers aren't responding to students, but they're actually really having a day to use some of these tools. Um, and do some PLC work online with as colleagues, which I know they're already doing. I mean, and there are groups of teachers that are coming together and really learning to use the tool because one teacher's leading a meeting. Um, and we'll look at that. I will say Flex Friday for the families that need it from the emails that I see, it's been absolutely essential. And we have students who, well, we're in our second round of Chromebooks, put it that way. I think I told you we, we were up to 170 at our last meeting. We've brought in another 200 and um, Dr. Carabillo and I, you know, continue to hand them out every day. Uh, if a keyboard breaks, a screen breaks. So we have kids um, that aren't able to do their work. We also have students that are in families where mom or dad are sick or their, um, you know, dad's having to stay somewhere else because he's uh, been with people that are positive. So we're being very um, attentive and making sure we're balancing the needs of everybody. And on those Flex Fridays, I think we need to do, for those families that want more, we can provide more in other ways. But the families that feel like they're just piling on, uh, I had an email today when you know a parent was talking about her child can't finish the work until you know seven or eight o'clock at night. And um, everybody's just in different circumstances. Last Friday, one that really resonated was two working parents that are working full time. They have uh, three younger children in their family. They feel like Monday through Thursday are really hectic. And Friday is their time as a family to not be, to, to, to take off some of the stress and pressure and be able to make sure all of their work is done for the week and feel like they're really able to help their children. So I think it's mixed, but I will tell you that definitely from teachers and from the emails I get, it's much more, uh, it's much more positive than not. Um, and I think, again, I think there's a solution for parents that just want more work. I think we can put a repository out there where they could go for extra practice and use extra platforms uh, and continue the new learning where on the flip side, the families that are really, where it's stressful and they really need that flex and the teachers to learn the new tools right now. Um, I think it's necessary, but we'll look at the calendar and see how that plays out according to what comes down Thursday. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Downey, I saw you had your hand up and then I think it went away. I don't know if you wanted to speak. Um, yes, actually, Tony, um, your last response kind of tied into what I was going to ask about. If, as we're expecting, it's a longer, and jump back and say thank you again for all your hard work, um, daily, up and down, in and out, every hour. Um, if we are going to have a longer term closure, which I think we're all expecting, we're certainly expecting past April 20th. The, the question is just how much longer. Um, do you have a plan in place, and this kind of goes to what you were just saying, about additional assistance to give the teachers the tools to get through the rest of the school year in a meaningful way so that we are satisfied with, and, and I, I agree with you, this is not a substitute for in-school learning, but to make the best possible outcome given the circumstances that we're dealing with, do you have a or are you formulating your game plan for how you're going to help the staff if it is a very long-term closure? Yeah, I really think it's, I think it's happening right now. So, you know, we have coaches and, and positions that aren't attached to actual classrooms and they have been uh, working directly with teachers who want to learn a new tool or a platform. We have had, I mean, I know one group of teachers last week, for instance, one of the teachers was really strong in Google Classroom and understanding the whole like Google Meets piece. So led all of the colleagues in their high school content area. So they're all logging on together. And I would say on a daily basis that that's happening all across the district. Um, we're looking at the 28th right now and how could we structure if we want to have the professional development day because that's the hardest thing is they're building, you know, content all day long, um, emailing and, and responding to students and parents. Um, so trying to find the time for them to do it is that's part of their their struggle really it's there are not enough hours in the day and feed their family and do whatever else but we're making it we're making it happen on, I would, on a daily basis all across the district and i will say one thing that we're also trying to do is when parents 
um, are, are upset with a teacher or they feel like maybe the, the teacher isn't responding. And I'll give you an example, like a parent may send an email on Monday and let's say they don't get a response and it's now Wednesday or Thursday, we're encouraging them to reach out to the principal because we also need to do wellness checks for our own staff who may be going through something in their home environment and they just, you know, they don't, they haven't asked for help, they haven't asked for a day off. Um, you know, in this month, I can honestly say I haven't had one teacher that needed a, a leave of absence, for instance, which is unbelievable because I know some of them, I know some of the circumstances are really challenging and they still kind of keep trudging along. So we want to continue to support them. And I think from the calendar standpoint, that's why from a superintendent, we want to know what we're doing. <laughs> we hope the state will tell us because we have a June 2nd primary day. Well, if we're back in school, if doors open June 1st, guess what? We're off on June 2nd because we can't have school when we have the primary. Um, if that can be a day that we can continue through, we, we get to look at April 28th. How are we going to capture that? Um, and we, I look at like Norwalk, um, Norwalk has set their schedule up where they're looking at doing it's every 10 days, they take a flex day. So they'll do five days, four days flex day. And so we'll work with GEA to see, you know, what, what really will work the best for us according to placing the calendar if it goes through the end of the year. All right, Mr. Chair. Um, Tony, I think I've. I appreciate the update, uh, helpful to get. Um, I guess I would give you three bits of input um, and they won't come as a surprise to you. Um, I would not wait for Hartford. I find when every time we talk about these updates, you're fre frequently talking about the state, the state, the state, and Hartford. Um, Pay attention to what Hartford's doing, but I think the more important thing to do, uh, which should be your North Star, um, is not what Hartford's worried about, um, but you should be worrying about what the parents and representing the students in, in Greenwich need and want. And the reality of it is, is that I think if you talk in the community, what I'm hearing in the community is everyone expects uh, us to be out for an extended period of time. I think you should also anticipate that even though schools may be reopened, there may be parents who choose not to send their children back to school. And they'll, um, and I, I can't imagine as a board, we're gonna take a very hard line with a set of parents if schools were to open really early. Um, given that Greenwich is particularly a hot spot for COVID. Um, if you looked at the update today, there have been 228 cases of COVID in Greenwich. Uh, Greenwich, Stanford, Lower Fairfield County is a hot spot um, in the state, as is New York for the nation. I think the corollary there is clear. So, and I, I know I've talked to you numerous times about um, here in our community, we tend not to wait for what Hartford's doing uh, because Hartford, particularly the State Department of Education, um, you know, they worry about the rest of the state. Fairfield County is a very different animal. That's part one. Part two is um, I, I'm troubled to hear that we still are allowing and haven't set a set of standards um, at the district level for, um, you know, which is a continuation of what we seem to do in Greenwich. We let this thousand flowers bloom thing go, which is we kind of let every teacher kind of do their own thing. And I heard you say it in two ways. Um, one, there don't seem to be any standards in terms of technology. I'm amazed. In one breath, we hear, um, well, you know, our teachers really struggle with technology. Meanwhile, our experts that are at Havemeyer, um, we don't seem to have set a set of technology standards. As an example, I would never have selected Zoom. Zoom is, um, it, it, I, I, knowing what I know about information technology, as a district over a month ago, 
and I brought it up, I, I, I think I would have selected a technology platform that is one that we can pick, rely on, is secure, protects personal information and data, and then our teachers could be trained to. The idea of teachers training on whichever kind of platform they pick means that students also have to be trained or parents are training on the platform that each individual teacher is picking. There's no value add in having different video conferencing platforms or different small group for either large group instruction, small group instruction, or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I, 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 I think it would be wise if in the next day or so, don't wait for Hartford, um, let's pick a technology platform. And if that means we have to spend money to do it, I would hope we would do that. If it's one we already have and use, terrific. If it's one we need to buy or purchase, um, then bring that to the board and let's get that done quickly. As an example, uh, WebEx from Cisco, very, very secure. Um, the uh, share, what replaced the share platform at Microsoft, very, very secure. Some of the Google platforms, which are free, very, very secure. Zoom, not very secure. Ring Central, not very secure. So I would, I would love to see the district setting a standard. Um, that doesn't mean teachers don't still maintain flexibility. The other thing that I'm hearing from parents is, I, I'd like us to see us have some standards, minimum standards, not maximum standards, not absolute straitjacket standards, but minimum standards that are being set by you, the superintendent, and you, you're in your cabinet that says, hey, for each grade level, here's what you're supposed, here's what's expected. As an example, some of the independent schools have, um, and I think parents are seeing this contrast because we have st students whose parents have kids in independent schools and then kids in our schools. And I'm hearing from them and they're seeing the great contrast. Mr. Kelly brought up a solution, having a solution. Um, parents are bringing these solutions forward because they're seeing what they're getting in other districts and other schools. And they seem to be standards of, for the point of social emotional learning as an example, um, at least by subject or by grade, particularly at elementary level, that a teacher is bringing together a class on a secure platform at least once a week so that they can feel that connectedness and bring that peace of mind that routine brings to students. Other, um, also having a standard where you say, if you're going to do small group instruction or one-on-one -on -one office hours, here's when you do them and here's how long you must do them for. And if you're gonna have small group instruction, have that be um, at least whatever it is, once a week, whatever it may be. Um, I think what I'm hearing in the community is lack of standards, lack of consistency. Um, you know, if you happen to be one of those teachers, students who are in a class that the teacher is very technology savvy, recording their own content, hosting meetings a lot, lots of Zoom meetings and what have you, parents are thrilled. I'm really worried about the consistency of the educational experience now that we've been out three or four, almost four weeks, that the consistency of the educational experience doesn't seem to have gelled yet. And I would hope to see some leadership from your office and your direct staff to buildings around a set of minimum standards, be they technology or engagement with uh, teachers that could bring a bit more consistency to the educational experience. It also is probably the next logical step as um, I'd love to think we'd go back to school right away. I think hope is not a strategy, as they say. We need to be planning um, as other districts are doing to be out for the full year and uh, bringing a bit more consistency um, to our educational process. Tony, do you want to respond to any of that? No, just thank you know. Thank you for the comments. Um, you know, we're continuing to grow, and I think that that's 
you know, all of these um, issues. I, and again, even with the, the Zoom versus Google Meets, I need to read the document from the state. And, and I do have to rely on the state for things like grading and attendance and that, it, that they're regulating that for us. And so when I, when I talk about Hartford, I'm talking about the things they do regulate. And, and you know, I just, I wanna assure our, our community that we are listening to our parents, to our teachers. Uh, we are taking guidance and feedback and we are constantly updating and changing to make sure we're being very responsive while also trying to balance um, this incredibly difficult situation for teachers and families. And also the superintendents in this region are all very connected. We're all, um, we all look pretty much the same. We're doing asynchronous and synchronous. Um, we do look different than private schools. We have totally different issues. Um, the private schools, a lot of our parents compare us to do not have special education. Uh, they don't um, take children um, for special education services. And, you know, it's, it is a challenge. Um, we, that's why the guidance document again tonight will be really good for us to know recording meetings, not recording meetings. The first uh, guidance we had for us as a public school from an equity standpoint, we can't hold a, a class uh, lesson if you can't really record the meeting because then you are saying to certain children, we know you can't participate and we are denying you public education. Um, I'm hoping the guidance tonight may be different once I read the document. That's one question we've all had is how, how can we, once you've recorded uh, any sort of session, how do you put it out there when you know that other students and other parents can actually see who's in the class, uh, could see names or hear names, um, so we're, we're working through all of those issues for public schools. The private schools don't have those same challenges, but um, we're working together as a team, I would say, in this region, and we're all sharing resources. So we definitely are continuing to get better, um, and we take, we take everybody's comments to heart. So thank you. Oh, Peter. Peter? Yeah, I had a question for you. Um, or whoever's the chair of our negotiations committee, um, there was a rumor going around, which I think best I can read in reading the teacher's contract is unfounded. Someone was running around saying, because I heard multiple people saying it, which I don't think is fair to our teachers. It said, the, t the, t the contract we have with GEA uh, uh, specifically prohibits the uh, recording of uh, lessons, uh, a teacher's presenting lessons. And I, I said, I, I can't imagine that's true. And I read through our most, our current in force contract, and there's no clauses relating to that. Is there a, some legal restriction on that, that uh, you know of as the, when you were negotiating the contract? Well, you, you were the, the only you, person left on the board. Well, you, you were that contract. You, you were the chair when we negotiated. Oh, no, you weren't the chair when we negotiated the contract. Uh, I've not heard that rumor. Um, certainly, I'll take a look at the contract. And I know, Tony, you've been working directly with Carol. So why don't you jump in? Um, really, uh, what the parent is probably referencing is exactly what I'm talking about in the memo guidance tonight. So by FERPA, um, we do not have the capacity to video a teacher in their classroom, all of their children, what they're saying, and, and, and then take that, put it back out online for other families to see, you know, who had, a, who had assistance with somebody online with them, uh, who had something perhaps that they could have said was modified, you know, in the class, what questions were people asking? So that's part of the guidance that we have been asking for. And I, and I think it's, it's changing because they're trying to refine it for us in public schools, but it has to do with FERPA and, and, and privacy, student privacy. Yes, that part makes sense. I, the other part didn't make any sense to me. I, I get the part, you know, like uh, um, someone was saying, and I just made no sense, but I'm glad you've straightened it out. If a teacher is recording a lesson, not with students, I'm not talking about recording a, um, a, a group session, that's different, right? Because there's three levels of this thing, right? Um, but what if a teacher wants to record themselves delivering a lesson, um, there's no restrictions on that, correct? 
That's correct. And that is on the guidance document that our staff has. If they want to record himself or herself, that that is absolutely fine. And, you know, if they're at home and they want to do as much as they can, you know, download or upload um, from their living room or wherever they're recording and it's just the teacher, that's fine. All right, uh, Ms. Hirsch. Oh, I was jumping back to flexible Fridays and social and emotional learning with which there were a few questions that were asked before. And um, I know we had spoken again about this a little bit earlier. I just was wondering for po the possibility to use some of those flexible Fridays for students that feel that they need a little bit more interaction to do some social and emotional lessons or utilizing some of the staff that um, like our coaches and to come on to do some of those lessons with our students to allow them to get connected to do something. I know um, for gym class, for instance, um, my daughter was uh, asked to um, a choreograph a dance that other students might then learn. Um, just another way for them to be able to be connected and to be able to utilize some of those flexible Fridays where some of the staff needs it and a lot of the students may need it to um, to catch up, um, but the other students who are looking for some connectivity uh, can utilize it that way. I'm not really sure if that's an option, but it's, I just thought I'd put that one out there. Yeah, that's part of what we're working on right now. When I talk about like kind of a phase two and doing more social emotional um, kind of support and how we can use some of those, uh, whether that is like a, an online chess or, you know, to engage students in other ways. And um, part of that is we, we've got to figure out which staff are interested in doing that. Um, even with our athletic coaches, um, I don't believe that they came back to HR yet to say that they feel like they can take that on. So um, if, they're, if they're really struggling with whatever you know, is happening right now, they may not be able to. Um, I'm hoping out of the number of people that we have on staff that we'll have enough that we can actually offer some you know, new and different things that would engage our students. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sheriff, so you have your hand up again. Yeah, I was going to say, Peter, um, over the last week, I've heard something that I was really surprised to hear. And maybe we can take this up in agenda planning. It's probably not a subject for tonight to discuss. I have heard parents, and, and this is probably just concern and fear in the absence of information, but I, it's probably something we'll have to take up is I have heard, and I can't imagine somebody would want to do this. I wouldn't want to do it, but uh, for my children. But there are some parents who are saying that they may, if this continues through the remainder of the year, they'll want their children to repeat. And I don't know what the implications of that are um, in terms of capacity, um, other issues that we would need to face. So I would hope at some point, um, if this continues on and we get guidance that we're going to be out for the remainder of the year, uh, we should probably start thinking and anticipating um, what kind of, let Tony manage the day to day. But I would hope as a board, we would start thinking about maybe some more longer range strategic issues. Um, the other thing I I hope we would think about is, God forbid, but all the experts seem to say that it's likely that uh, COVID uh, could return in the fall, which would mean we potentially would have an impact to next year. So I would hope we would find some time on our agenda um, to maybe as a board, the eight of us, start thinking about what some of the more strategic ramifications are of what um, Dr. Fauci is now coining the new normal, that term is back, the new normal, um, and listening to the experts that this may go on for a while, and maybe we can be a little bit more anticipating um, while our staff has to deal with the realities of reacting in real time. Well, I'm sure Tony just took down those topics because I think those are things that are probably on her mind as well. Uh, I think what we'll end up doing, and we can talk more about this at agenda planning, is this is going to be a recurring item as a superintendent update. As many times as we meet, I don't think I don't think we can hear from Dr. Jones enough or have this conversation with her. We can we can continue to have that conversation at that point. We can schedule it. I don't want to be chicken little, Peter, and I don't want to try to uh, you know try to say the sky is falling. But but I hear you, and I think it's uh, it's good to start thinking about that and everything we're learning now. Obviously, Tony's updating the playbook for the teachers on a 
on a regular basis. So that playbook's not going anywhere. Um, anyway, uh, so with that, uh, Tony, we're, there, were, there were two things I wanted to, to cover off. I mean, obviously, uh, your focus, our focus is, has been on health and safety of students. Uh, obviously, continuing to talk about academics, but that last piece, that mental health piece. Wondering what we're doing, how we're continuing to enhance what we're doing uh, to provide those services remotely, because I know it's it's a challenge. It's been a challenge from day one, but I just I want to kind of dig into that a little bit. Yeah, we I mean, it's really on two different pieces. One is monitoring students and staff health, um, looking for students, for instance, who are not logging on and they, you know, they've literally it's been two weeks and, and nobody's really heard from them, making sure that we're um, calling the home, emailing the home, if we need to do wellness checks, making sure we're doing that. Um, we're also making sure that our, our own staff, our psychologists are reaching out, you know, as necessary, um, you know, to families and to students. Um, some of those one-on-one -on -one sessions where children may have some uh, like behavioral and emotional challenges anyway, high anxiety, making sure we're working with them. Um, if we have students who it's just not working for and they're not keeping pace, for instance, without high anxiety and stress, let's modify their schedule. Let's figure out um, specifically on their schedule who's going to do a one-on-one -on -one, a phone conference or, or meets with them so they can see the person. We're gonna check in every morning. We're gonna check in you know, every afternoon. So there's a multitude of ways and it's very individualized. But I would say the hardest thing is just monitoring those who are generally very healthy. Um, you know, right now we're seeing people who are really struggling um, from a parent where they just lost, there's two parents and they just lost their jobs. And so they haven't needed our, for instance, lunches and breakfast. And now all of a sudden the income has stopped. Um, they can't pay the internet bill, so they need a hotspot. Um, and this is across town. It's not, um, you know, it's not in one school or one area. This is really across. And for our staff, we're looking for, if we're getting quite a few parents saying, what's going on? They're not really communicating, not answering emails. They're, we're not even seeing a picture of the teacher. We're making sure we're following up. Is that teacher, is everything okay also for them? Um, and that's connecting everything from uh, 211. We also have an employee assistance program that we want to make sure if people need counseling because of what's going on. Um, we're mobilizing every resource the same way that we that we normally would. Um, and if necessary, we'll send, we call 911 and send somebody to the home. We had that uh, as recent as today. So um, we're doing everything we can to really, to make that first and foremost, to make sure people are safe and healthy. Thank you. And, and you know, I don't speak for the rest of the board, but I'm sure they join me in following on, on something Joe said. You know, please thank the teachers and the administrators for continuing to, to, to learn and do and, and work really, really hard. Um, everybody's challenged and, and challenged in different ways, but I, uh, I really want to commend everybody for just continuing to move forward and continuing to iterate and, and get better. And I, honestly, I think uh, even the content I'm seeing from my own kids, the teachers are, are getting amazingly creative with the tools. Um, so it's, it's been fun to see that iteration and I, you know, I would encourage more of it. Uh, Ms. Stowe, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to continue that positive theme. The website changes are fantastic because as a parent, I get the updates all the time from you, Tony, but if you're just a community member and you want to go on and see what's happening, I think this lays it out really well. So thanks for those changes. And I might just give credit to, uh, that's Irene Parisi and Sasha, uh, who have really worked hard on that on the back end. So thanks to them. And I'm sure there's more of uh, Irene's curriculum staff that are also part of that but they're really working hard to keep that information up to date uh, and putting more up there every day if we need to. All right, I don't think anybody else has their hand up, so we'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is the GHS Entryway uh, Inspects First Read. So I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Jones. Um, I think we'll jump right into this one. I know I believe there's gonna be a screen share, so you'll be able to see uh, the renderings and the ed spec. But before we start, we have two ed specs that are on the agenda tonight. And just as um, this meeting was, ori was originally not planned, as you know, we added it um, so we could do an update. And we wanted to take this opportunity to get feedback from the board. So 
this is not meant to be, um, we're gonna go out and build tomorrow. This really is a basic uh, ed spec to show you where we are. We wanna get your feedback on both of these two projects. And once we get your feedback tonight, we'll be able to make adjustments. Um, the ed spec is really talking about the spaces. It's the very feasibility first step in any project. And that's really what, what the goal is. Um, we will meet with the committee between now and the next meeting, we'll have to do virtual and uh, to get more feedback because this was already planned to be on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, we knew it was gonna be on that one. So I look forward to your feedback on all the work that's been done and um, I'll turn it over to Dave Stein who's here uh, with Silver Petrocelli um, and let him take over. Great. Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see those who I can and those I can't. Hopefully everybody is well. Um, I will try to do a screen share as I'm working through a few monitors and technology. So hopefully it'll work. I think uh, I'm able to um, do this. If everybody could sort of give me a nod that they can now see a PowerPoint screen that has popped up. Yeah, it's, it's come up. Great. Okay. So, um, so we've started, um, we started and was hired um, just at the beginning of the year. And, and we started off with just understanding some of the patterns and overall security concerns um, at the entryway. Our firm, um, our firm primarily works in the educational um, arena. So we have, um, we have done many projects like this. Um, over the past few years. And, and the first thing we begin to sort of observe is the, um, is the circulation patterns. And, and your, your facility, which, um, which is a fairly large school, um, and uh, entry is, is a key piece of it. So just as we begin to sort of look at this, you know, thousand foot view of your overall campus, uh, our entry is key to the public to to not only be as an identifier but to be a security point of how the public or visitors would be entering in um, so you know one of the things we began to observe is how that entryway is sort of pushed back you have a really nice open plaza that's there um, even in these this screenshot that you see um, there is some landscaping and, and, and other amenities and site features that are there um, that, that do add to sort of the overall context of that. But from a security perspective, um, it's, important to, um, it's important to keep those viewpoints open to the street so um, first responders have the ability to see inward and uh, the administration and security has the ability to see Outward. So those are the first things we began to observe as we begin to look at this from a site perspective. Then we get sort of closer to, um, to your entryway. And these three um, viewpoints that I'm showing here, you know, begins to show us immediately there is not a, a weather lock or a, um, a, a separate entryway. You immediately are, are entered in as a visitor you are buzzed in, the security desk is located to the image just to the left, and, and you are now sort of in that open corridor with students and teachers and so forth. So, you know, the first thing we want to do um, is to begin to sort of explore what we can do. The one thing I want to point out is the guidance that we are working with is the um, school uh, facility standards that was developed um, just after just after the, um, the, the tragedy that happened in Newtown. Um, and then it was recently amended, um, well, five years ago. And that's really the guideline that as designers and educators are using to, uh, uh, to work with. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through, but that really sets the mandates and then also suggestions or guidelines that they put forward as we're trying to explore how can we create a safe entryway. So I have a floor plan that gives you just an overall context. Um, you could see just at the bottom of the page, and I'm not sure, could everyone see my cursor moving around? Um, you may not. Um, but uh, you could see the circles, those are the planters that are in the plaza. And then the areas that we have sort of in white is where we are proposing to add 
an addition to the building to create a secure vestibule. I'll zoom into that on my next slide, which begins to show an addition, which is approximately 2,200 square feet. It needs to be large enough because your students enter and exit through there on a daily basis. In the morning, there's, um, there's a large population of students and faculty and staff that enter in. Um, but you also do have some visitors at times that enter in during that morning entry point. So what we are proposing to do is to create sort of a separation. We're showing visitors to the left and students to the right. That'll be identified through signage and wayfinding, which is important to have. That wayfinding could extend all right out to the street um into the parking lots and around the uh, walking areas so people understand that there is restrictive access that the public should enter in in a particular way and provide some wayfinding to get you towards that entry piece it's divided in a way that the students would be able to enter in and this there needs to be further conversations as to what uh, access the students would have whether it would go to a card key or a, uh, a fob type of access, would those doors be locked um, just after the school, school starts, um, and then the visitors are buzzed in. We have proposed to move the security desk inward into the secure vestibule. Um, that now becomes the gatekeeper, so visitors can enter in, they will be buzzed in, and they can sign in. They also have the ability to now enter into to the left to a new lobby, um, which is part of the administrative suite, because currently you need to go into the existing corridor and then meet with the administration. The guidelines encourage us to provide that separation so there could be sort of a double level check security into the office and then uh, you're able to be guided to um, to any parts any parts of the school. Um, we wanted this plan to be large enough again to accommodate students, whether they are waiting for uh, parents to pick them up um, and to provide at least some part of an assembly. We didn't want this just to be a small entry vestibule or a weather lock. This wanted to be a space that was identifiable and you'll see from the images that the architecture needs to speak to the entry. It, it's key for that. If we understate it, it will not be um, it, it will not be as secure as just a small vestibule. Um, you'll see from the images we need to fortify. And what I mean by fortifying is any glazing that we're going to be proposing needs to meet a, a ballistic standard. Um, and the guidelines is sort of a level four ballistic rating um, in which we would have a bullet resistant on the outside and uh, or vice versa, it would be ballistic rating um, on the inside too. Um, as I mentioned, the security desk also has viewing of that corridor. Um, part of the security would have the technology of video in which monitors would be placed there. There would also be a, uh, a duress button or a panic button that would be located there. And obviously communication with the office and any other staff that's located there. Right now your security desk is fairly understated and we want the architecture to allow it to be more, um, more stated, um, more of a stately um, architectural element that's located located in there. So I'm gonna to go to some of the concepts. And I wanna point out, these are just ideas. These are just things that we began to look at. Um, obviously it could change and many reiterations could be put in place. And this is all just to develop that educational spec. It is not necessarily to say that this is a final design in any manner. So I wanna make that point. So from the image that we have here, we're, we're showing a uh, glass, a uh, curtain wall entryway that again would have that ballistic rating that's located all the way through. It's called school guard glazing. It's used um, throughout, um, throughout the country. 
Um, and this now creates an open view. The reason why we do not want to create just a brick box is we, we are using glass, even though that may seem counterintuitive, is we want to have as much transparency inward and outward. We do not want to create large pockets. Even though we're showing nice landscaping in this rendering, that's going to need to be studied to make sure that there aren't areas that anybody could hide behind, especially in the planters and the large trees that are located there. Um, some of the design features, just what we were thinking, it's more of just sort of bringing some creativity to this, is you start seeing the wood that's located on that top of that roof that carries some of the design themes that are already in the existing building. So we're trying to bring some of that outward uh, into, the overall, into the overall design. The next image shows what that would look like in the evening. Sight lighting is key, especially during our dark days of summer when it is fairly dark at dusk and dawn. Um, this entryway needs to be well illuminated. We need to be sensitive to the neighbors. So the reason why we're proposing those lights to shine downward as opposed to upward is obviously important to um, light pollution and just being respectful of the neighbors who have viewpoints of that front entryway. The view that you see here uh, begins to show, and it doesn't necessarily correlate with the floor plan that we have as we're continually maturing the plan. But what it shows is that greeter that's located there has good viewing outward, as I mentioned. Uh, there would be a divider so the public or visitors do not cross paths directly with the students. So this view doesn't show that, but our plan did show that we would create a divider. So we were able to separate that. Um, and I think that's important to do. Um, the last image that I have here for you shows that inner corridor and during the day, most of you I'm sure know it is pretty busy as uh, students and teachers are navigating through. So this sort of half circle that's located there gives that security desk um, the ability to look through and potentially communicate with students on the other, on the other side and just see what's going back back and forth. And then lastly, this, the, the uh, screen that I have in front of you just gives you more of just an overall executive summary of the educational spec that I began to prepare, shows some bullet items. So some of the keys that we are proposing within the main lobby is a one story slab on grade structure, approximately 2,200 overall square feet it would be a steel, steel stupor structure with a glass facade, and I mentioned the blast resistant glazing and the metal curtain wall framing. The administration offices would be uh, modified to relocate the uh, greeter desk inward, so it also has views into the lobby um, and is able to greet those visitors directly without the visitors going into the main entryway prior to uh, receiving the credentials to do so. Uh, the entry doors would be metal frame doors with a blast resistant system. Any of the interior doors would be the same. They would have a bullet resistant system, which is the equivalent of the um, UL rating or other equivalently testing. That is a mandate that's in the state security standards. Access control would have electronic access to all of those entry doors, whether that's done by fob or card or wireless, that could be explored going forward. All of those doors are, have an electronic release that can be uh, activated by the security workstation or by the administrative workstation. Cameras should be located um, viewing the main entryway and parking areas, and those monitors should be located within the security desk so they have the ability to um, scan through and see those various entry points. You have um, an enormous amount of entry points within the school, so it's gonna be critical to have the ability to see where people are coming in and, and out. Um, that monitoring would have the ability to have DVR recording um, 
and the system engineers could obviously work on how that's administered and so forth. And then perimeter access locking or alarm devices that are located there um, to be able to lock or unlock the entry points at any time. Specifically, the security workstation, as I mentioned, in any design, it should be centrally located within that vestibule. It should have visibility to all doors, the doors from the outside, the doors from the inside. The workstation shall be um, potentially elevated. The complication with that, my plan does not show it being elevated, is we need to make it handicap accessible. Um, so I'd need to create a ramp there, and um, that just gets to be complicated as we create another impediment for somebody to hide behind. So I think we need to talk through that um, as the plans get further developed. But we want to make sure that that security person has good visibility and elevating them sort of gives that the, them the overview of, of doing that. I mentioned having a panic or duress button that's immediately there in case there is an emergency. And I talked about the monitor piece. Wayfinding is a key piece. It may seem sort of as a passive thing, but as visitors enter, even as myself coming to the school for the first time, having wayfinding to point me to that uh, entry point and also to uh, put any restrictions, let them know there is video surveillance that is taking place. Those type of things are very helpful in just securing the overall site. Obviously, we're creating a 2200 square foot space, so we need to be cognizant of how we're heating and cooling that space. So any of the systems that we would be proposing uh, would, um, would be energy efficient and should meet those Connecticut high performance building standard guidelines. The lighting would also need to be LED. And as I mentioned, the security lighting is key to that. So the design needs to contemplate the right levels of security lighting and how that is turned on or turned off during the day or even off hours at night, whether it's through motion or a motion detection or so forth. And then lastly, the life safety components of that is we need to make sure we're maintaining the proper means of egress through that vestibule. Um, looking at your overall building, you have a large amount of egress that's shown uh, within the code plans. So we need to make sure that we're maintaining proper egress outward. Even though we may be locking people coming in, we need to make sure we maintain proper egress outward. Um, and any of that would be tied into your fire alarm, um, which needs to be that panel that needs to be located at or near the workstation. So any of your emergency service um, uh, uh, members would, uh, whether it's fire or police, are able to come in and have that station directly at the front entryway. That is key. And what I'm talking about is fire alarm and pull stations and such that is required by the life safety code. So with that, that, that concludes um, the overall slides that I have. And obviously, I'm, I, I'm able to answer, I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, so if there's board members with questions, I'd ask you to raise your hand. Ms. Hirsch. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that great presentation. Um, I was going to ask a quick question about ADA accessibility, just making sure, well, assuming that all the wayfinding signage is also going to be created in a way and um, that makes it accessible to hearing and sight impaired visitors, um, as well as those in wheelchairs. But you addressed at least some, some of the questions I had about that. Um, so my second question would also be about, at one point there was a discussion, I know it's not relevant now, but uh, about adding a second story above our glass corridor for a secondary level for students to get from one side of our high school to another. Um, is this uh, addition being built so that there would be the ability to put a second story on at some point down the road if that ever came to pass? Uh, our addition is really independent of that corridor piece. So um, we are not Im imposing um, any structural loads onto that or really modifying that structure in any way. So with that in mind, if, um, if that is a future plan, I don't think that would have a significant impact on this, this addition. Um, and just to also point out in terms of the handicap accessibility, yes, we do need to take that into consideration. This plaza actually has a fairly good slope 
from the street up to the front door. It's actually, if you could believe it, it, it drops. Um, it drops, I think, about eight inches from, from front to back. So we need to make sure that that front entryway to where we're bringing the addition out, we have to deal with the accessibility at that piece. Inside, when we get into the space, um, the, the administrative space is actually a foot higher. Um, so that's the reason why you see that, uh, that ramp that's located there to provide accessibility up because the finished floor, um, as I mentioned, is about a foot different. So we've, we've noted that in, um, in the overall design. Th thank you for addressing that. You're welcome. All right, uh, David, this is Peter Bernstein. Just a, a question for you. Is the width of the existing hallway staying the same or are you shrinking that? I see the bump out for security, but it, it also looks like it, it's cutting into it. Is that right? Yeah, so the only, the only piece that we are protruding into the hallway is that small semicircle that you sh see there. Um, one of our previous schemes actually had it a little further in and, and, some, and there were some comments back. Um, but overall, um, the dimension to the left is about, so the, the hallway to the left where it says existing ramp up, that hallway is about 17.6. The hallway to the right is about 15 feet. Uh, and where our, our projection is, that semicircle, we're at 17.7. So we are reducing it slightly, but at that point, it, we're not creating a pinch point, nor are we narrowing down that piece any lower than um, exists to the left, and it's still wider to the corridor to the right. All right, um, and, and I guess, could you do it without the bump out, just out of curiosity? Absolutely, all I was trying to achieve was just uh, a little more visibility for that security guard, but that can be achieved through, um, through video technology, if that's a concern, so absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Downey. Um, I just wanted to just chime in a few words just since I was the one, um, the board rep on the committee. And I just want to say that we had excellent discussions within the committee. I think there were general unanimity on a lot of the decisions that came forth, um, maybe if not on all of them, um, in terms of the different options that were presented to us and the different aesthetics. Uh, consistent with what the RFP was, because I know Karen asked about the second story. That wasn't part of the RFP. The RFP was really about the entryway, um, but the reconfiguring of the office made a lot of sense to the committee in the process of the discussions in terms of access um, and what the goals that we're trying to achieve. Um, so we also need to be looking at GHS's security generally, because this is obviously, you know, once the school day starts and there were discussions about that as well, whether we need to focus on those as well, but that was kind of beyond the scope of this project. But I just wanted to kind of say we're a very productive committee with a lot of different viewpoints. We had teachers, um, we had people from the BET, we had parents. Um, from all the, the PTA presidents. So we had a very diverse group of points of view on the committee uh, looking at the issue. So thank you to the art, architects coming up with this. Thank all right, um, go ahead, David. No, I said thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing any other hands yeah. raised. We'll just take a second if there's somebody else that wants to, uh, wants to speak. If not, David, thank you very much. We appreciate your joining us tonight and, and sharing this and uh, we'll take it up at a uh, future meeting. Great, thank you for everybody. And uh, I actually enjoyed all the insightful discussion before you guys are doing an incredible job as we work with many districts and they're seeing what everybody's struggling with. So hopefully everybody stays safe and um, thank you for having me tonight. Good night. Thanks so much. Yep, bye-bye. All right, with that, the next item on our agenda is the Julian Curtis Ed Spec. So Dr. Jones, I'll turn it back to you. Um, okay, just a quick mention on the JC Ed Specs. A uh, little different project when you're doing, when you're looking at an entire elementary school. Um, so what, what, where the process is right now, obviously you start with um, what our facilities plan, master plan had for deficiencies. Um, got, we have feedback from the committee 
lots of, of discussion about um, kind of what are the spaces, what are some of the things we need to consider. Um, and then the next work was really more, uh, I'm gonna say staff architecturally before we go back out because uh, it's going back through, we, which we were, uh, my understanding and from the advice from the board and also from members of even BET, be sure we took the new lab uh, ed spec and, and put that up against what we're looking at for JC. So it was going you know, room by room by room. What spaces do you have at JC? What are the sizes and the square footage? And how does that compare to what we just did at New Lab when we're looking at parity across the district? Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Costa, who's with Perkins and Eastman, who's gonna walk you through. I would say the two areas, and I'm sure they stood out to most of the board that, we, that we'll want input on that is um, pre-K, and again, that's because we're modeling after the new lab ed spec. And if you look at our pre-K growth over the last um, you know, decade, and you're looking at a project that's gonna go out multiple decades, do we or do we not in our Title I school follow the ed spec like we did at uh, new lab for pre-K? Um, the second item would be the community connections. And that is just in discussion um, about a program that we have, which is where we serve our children after they turn 18 and they stay with us to 22. And that program has tended to not have a real home. It was at Millbank for a while, right next door to JC. And they actually would um, volunteer at JC and would go in and, and help in classrooms or library. Um, this year they were at St. Catharines. Next year they'll be at the bank building, but they really haven't had a place to call home. And so, you know, do we want to consider, because this is right in the middle of town, and, and Joe can talk to how many square feet, I think it's around 1300 square feet, to have two small spaces uh, for the community connections to finally have a home, but it's an outside door, separate restroom. It's, the wall is attached, but it would be its own entrance. Um, and again, because they have volunteered there and, and been connected to the community in that area, it's food for thought. And it's really just for the, to get board input on, do we wanna have that in an ed spec and see how it, uh, how it plays out and obviously, you know, you don't, you're really not making super early decisions right now um, because it is just an ed spec and you're not committing dollars to actually build anything until we actually get into the design and you get into that process. So it very much is conversational on that piece. So Joe, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce your staff. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones, and good evening, uh, Board of Education. Thank you for inviting us uh, to your meeting tonight. I know there's a an awful lot on everyone's plate these days. So we'll try to be as brief as possible. And and I, I, I have to apologize ahead of time. We're still trying to get used to working uh, remotely. And sometimes we do have glitches. I'm gonna try to share my screen and uh, go through a PowerPoint that we prepared today. Uh, so you can look at what we're doing. Uh, let's see, here we go right here. Can everyone see that PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. We're gonna to go to our full screen in a minute. Okay, do you see that? I can. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so tonight we're not going to be showing you any renderings or uh, any perspectives. We're not quite there yet. We're still in the in the mode of gathering information and uh, developing concepts, looking at the building, doing assessments, that kind of thing. In fact, um, our team uh, um, has been looking at the building and the program since we were hired for this project back in January of this year. And we've really gotten our arms around the building and, and, and really starting to make some strides on the program and the kinds of spaces and the kinds of, of, um, of, of curriculum and kind of goals that you have in your, in your building. So this is a, um, a photo of your, of your building. And by the way, uh, we, we really like the building itself. We like the way it's been maintained and we especially are impressed with the site. Uh, it is one of the largest properties, um, school properties in the town of Greenwich and it, it really affords a lot of opportunities when we get to the actual design portion of this project.
Okay, so the feasibility study uh, really consists of several parts. Um, the first part, of course, is investigating the existing building. Um, and the master plan identified uh, three or four areas that are of grave concern to, uh, to the town. Among them are accessibility or ADA compliance. Um, the second would be the overall uh, building layout and configuration of the building and how spaces interact. Uh, of course, uh, safety, life safety and security is a, is a very, very big concern. And also space needs and how the building is going to uh, provide space and programs for 21st century learning. So generally, um, we're not gonna speak tonight in detail about the assessment of the facility, but we can say that it's been very, very well maintained. Um, systems that needed replacing or repair have been replaced or repaired with high quality products, meant to last a very long time. We believe you just had a, a roof job done last year and that is in perfect condition. Um, but the building is old. Uh, it's approaching 75 years old. And so we anticipate that if this building is going to be renovated, much of the systems, uh, the things that are hidden behind the walls or under floors, piping, wires, conductors, those kinds of things, we're probably gonna have to be replaced uh, with new products and uh, systems in, or in order to make the building uh, suitable for the next generation or two of students and teachers. There are some quirky spaces in this building. Um, there's some attic-like spaces that the district has made best use out of, uh, but don't necessarily meet today's standards for light, air, view, or accessibility. And those would be some of the things that we'll be looking at as we uh, develop the, the options. Uh, HVAC is a big concern. Um, right now, uh, the original building, I believe, was steam radiators. And at one point or another, um, unit ventilators were put in. And sometime after that, uh, window air conditioners were put in. So there is certainly an opportunity for a much more modern, much more energy efficient, and much healthier uh, system that uh, we'll be looking at. Uh, as part of the study. The second part of our work and probably where we're gonna spend most of our time tonight is developing the educational program or the EdSpec as it's, as it's noted. And the EdSpec is incredibly uh, important component to the study because it really provides a blueprint or a map for the, everything that comes after uh, the EdSpec including the layouts, how spaces inter interrelate, uh, things like equipment, um, square footages, all those kinds of components that will uh, inform uh, the town as well as the design team on what this building and what the program is gonna be, all stems from the ed specs. It's very, very important that we spend enough time talking about the ed specs and looking at what they mean, not only for today, but also for the next generation and how they're um, adaptable to, to future uh, teaching. So it's very important uh, that we spend some time on that. Obviously, uh, the ed spec is going to require um, board of education approvals. Um, and we, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, with your board and with educators to make sure that we get that right. Um, that particular document will become the document that the state will review when they're looking at your grant application. Uh, and we wanna make sure that is accurate and uh, reflects what, uh, what initiatives the, the town has and, and your board has. After we have the um, investigation, after we've looked at the educational program, we then create uh, solution options. And right from the very beginning, we were thinking that there's probably 
three, maybe four options for this particular study. First one will be a renovation addition uh, of the existing school, um, you know, in place. And, you know, we've been thinking about how, how this building can be transformed. Uh, the fact that it's a very uh, strong building uh, built uh, to last a very long time with high quality materials, good workmanship, and it's been maintained beautifully. There's probably a very strong option there that we want to look at very closely. Number two would be an all new replacement. Obviously it has to be replaced on the existing property. And as a large parcel, uh, there's some opportunities for some new footprints while maintaining um, the existing building. And then when the new building is completed, we would then um, demolish and, and replace whatever was been de uh, displaced by the new footprint of the building. And there's a couple of ideas floating around about that and how that's very possible. Third option is what we would call a hybrid scheme. And that uh, is, is different with number one in the fact that we'd probably look to demolish a portion of this building that we thought could not be efficiently uh, renovated or adapted to the new program. And then we would con construct probably a larger addition than perhaps would be constructed in the renovation option number one. All these particular options will have pluses and minuses. Um, all of them will have to accommodate students, parents, and teachers, keep students, parents uh, safe during construction, uh, which means that all of, the, all of the options would have to be phased. And when we start doing our option studies, we'll be showing you how those those projects can be phased and what that does to the construction schedule. So that'll be part of the thing that we look at. So when we're done, we're gonna have a report that begins to address all of the items up above. We're gonna talk about a project schedule and phasing plan. We're gonna present probable construction cost estimates. Uh, those estimates will be divided into two parts, uh, hard costs, bricks and mortar, construction management uh, fees, things like that. And the second half would be professional services, furniture and equipment and other incidentals <clears throat> so that you really have a full sense of what the budget of the, of the, of the options would be. It's very important that we cover all of the costs so that when the board and the town are looking at the options. They can do a true apples to apples comparison uh, uh, when they're deciding uh, which option to go with. Another component, although perhaps in Greenwich, because your reimbursement is one of the lowest, if not the lowest in the state, is the estimated state reimbursement. And as you know, at New Lebanon, you were very fortunate to get a very high reimbursement rate. I think it was 80%. I know that the town uh, went through some, some challenges getting the state to agree, but eventually you were uh, successful with that. There's certainly some opportunities for a high reimbursement rate for this school as well. We will have to look at that very carefully and probably approach it very conservatively at the very beginning and not overestimate what the state's gonna participate in. Obviously in the next few years, the state's gonna be very tight with the amount of money that it has in its budget and school construction is typically one of the places they'll be looking for to reduce their, um, their cost and their liabilities. And then finally, we'll be doing is we'll present uh, our, our findings. And, you know, obviously your board will be the first place we present, but there will be certainly other, other uh, venues and other opportunities to present the findings. And, you know, we'll, we'll take our clues from, you know, your leadership uh, and Dr. Jones' leadership, and we'll, we'll speak to whoever you want us to talk to as many times as you want. And obviously there will be graphics and, and presentations that can be set up on the, on the website where, so people can look at that information and um, begin to, to form opinions about uh, what the approach is. And then from there, um, we expect the town will select a preferred option. 
you know, starting with your board, moving to all the different uh, boards and commissions in town, and then ending up in a funding request from the representative town meeting. And that funding request will become part of the uh, state grant submission request that will be uh, putting, be putting together. Most likely we'll be helping you do that. Now in that, in that regard, and most of you are aware of this, there's really two deadlines. The first deadline for the initial application is June 30th of every year. And then there's actually a softer, uh, actually a harder deadline um, in November where the town or the district will have to um, have their funds available uh, in order to be accepted uh, as a viable uh, grant application. So there's really those two dates that you have to sort of keep in mind as you're thinking about uh, the overall schedule and what the town's going through in the next uh, few months. At this point, I wanna introduce um, two of our team members. Uh, Mike Berger is gonna speak in a couple minutes and uh, Mike Berger is a project designer and an a, um, associate principal with the firm. Um, Mike's been working on the program uh, all along and is beginning to start thinking about uh, the designs of the school. Um, also with me, I have, uh, Lauren Giamundo. Uh, Lauren is also an architect and an associate with the firm and has been putting uh, the existing drawings together. And um, I'm gonna let her talk a little bit about the status of the drawings and the kinds of tools that we use to prepare this study and ultimately to prepare a building design. Lauren, are you able to get on? Yep, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks Joe. Um, so. When we started on the project, um, we started by creating um, drawings of the existing building um, with parts of drawings that have been given to us by you. And also we conducted our own survey of the building ourselves, um, made sure that the drawings that we were given um, are accurate. Um, but doing the study ourselves and the walkthrough, we were able to um, confirms um, square footages of rooms, uh, ceiling heights, and um, all of this information is put into the program to make sure that your building is efficient and your rooms are not too oversized, undersized. We can do a, um, a study based on our analysis. Um, Joe, you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So the way we do our drawings is in 3D. Um, so We'll, you know, we'll have a better understanding of the entire building. Um, it also helps us, you know, along the way when we start doing additions and renovations that we can uh, present to you exterior and interior uh, views of the of the project um, and look at it from all angles. Our consultants also um, work in 3D as well, so this really helps. You know, when we're, you know, we're putting in mechanical ducts or structure that we can identify. Um, conflicts early on and make sure those, you know, types of conflicts don't happen if everyone's building in 3D. One of the things I want to point out on this three-dimensional drawings, it appears that the building is sticking out of the ground. What's happening there is the building modeling is actually showing the crawl space underneath the main floor. A unique feature of this particular school, and we've seen this very rarely, is that you actually have a full crawl space across the entire building. There's a portion of the lower level that's excavated even deeper for the mechanical spaces as well as for some storage space. But that fact alone is gonna be very, very beneficial when we're, when we're thinking about running new plumbing, new uh, communication, new drains, things like that. It's gonna be uh, a nice feature to have in this building. The other feature, of course, is the sloped roof and attic. And that particular space up there is going to be very useful when we're, when we're thinking about air handlers and air conditioning equipment and fans and ventilators and things like that. That provides a, a, a very good place to hide all that equipment and preserve the overall architecture of the building. Um, the chimney structures, when we looked at the 1946 drawings, were actually ventilation shafts 
So while they look like fireplaces and they're, they're meant to evoke fireplaces, they're actually used for ventilation shafts. Even back in the 1940s, they were, you know, they were thinking about moving a lot of air and, and keeping the building a healthy place. It's very, very unique kind of structure. Lauren? Yep, yeah, this is just a uh, view uh, from the other side. Um, you know, as Joe mentioned about the roof, that's another reason why modeling in 3D is so important with buildings like this. Obviously, you know, that wasn't used when the building was designed, but it really is, you know, the way of the future. And um, like I mentioned, you know, with mechanical plumbing um, and structure, having them also modeled in 3D, we can make sure that we're using you know, the attic space, you know, most efficiently and, you know, it'll really help us as we design um, any additions to the building as well. Yeah, what's interesting about the building is when you actually look at the original contract documents, they were actually dated before World War II. And it sounds like <clears throat> when the war broke out, they put the drawings on the shelf. And as soon as the war was over, they dusted them off and built the building, which is great because oftentimes mid-century schools are not the greatest construction and are often the schools that we, we typically will knock down because they're in such poor condition uh, you know, by, by this age. But not so on this particular building. And that's really something to keep in mind as we're gonna be looking through different options. Now, um, we did a very accurate analysis of the square footage. Um, and so you see the numbers there, we have about uh, 2,900 square foot in the basement. That's the part of the basement that I told you was excavated for storage and mechanical space. We did not include the crawl space, which is probably about five feet for headroom from the bottom of structure to the slab. Uh, we did not include that in the basement area. Uh, the first floor is just under 32,000. Second floor is just above 25,000. So the total building is about 60,500 square feet. Pretty good size uh, elementary school. I'm gonna hand it over to Mike a little bit to talk about 21st century schools and learning. Um, we're not showing a lot of photographs uh, tonight. We will once we get into the design, but I just want Mike to talk briefly about how he addresses the ed spec and how he goes about uh, figuring out what buildings look like. Mike? Sure, sure. thanks, Joe. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, if you go to the next slide. So as Joe mentioned, this we're really early in a design phase. Uh, you know, the feasibility uh, study is really um, the, the part in the project where we decide what type of project we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna move forward with, right? The renovation uh, addition, which would be a like new renovation, by the way, which means everything in the school uh, would have the lifespan um, and you know, the look, the touch, the feel of a brand new school, you know, including HVAC, the windows, the materials, um, accessibility, all ADA issues in the entire school would be addressed and brought up to, to current standards. Um, a hybrid uh, set would be the same, a like new renovation and a hybrid uh, configuration. Um, and obviously, a like an all new school, everything would be, be brand new within the school. Um, but we're, we're really early on in the design phases. Uh, so if you click it again, uh, Lauren, please. Yeah, so these are, these are the three guiding principles that we'll use even when we're developing the, the, the ed specs um, and then you know, the, the program. Uh, we're trying to set forward a really a, a roadmap and a kind of a loose uh, design guidelines for when this, when we go into real design a little bit down the road, whether it's our firm or another firm, hopefully our firm. Um, but we use these three guiding principles. First one is inspire. You know, we we, we want to create an exciting school that these kids want to go to to every day. Um, also for the educate or the, the uh, yeah the educators, um, you want to be able to you want to be able to attract and also retain the best of the best. Uh, but it's also for the the local neighborhood, the local community, and, and the town itself. It should be a facility that they're very proud of and they get a lot of use out of. Uh, comfort uh, means you know, physically comfortable, you know, the furniture you're, you're sitting in, but it's also a healthy building. It's the, the air you're breathing, the acoustics, making sure that students can hear um, everything and, and learn uh, the, the best that they can. It's about natural, uh, you know, natural light and views out of the school and also how the school is configured. Um, I think we have some really good, nice uh, ideas for the renovation and the hybrid um, 
uh, uh, you know, options as well as the new school that we're currently working on. And adapt, adapt really, you can probably underline that one. That, that's critically important because uh, you know, there's ever changing uh, instructional methods uh, that are happening. You know, the, for the past 70 plus years at the school has been, uh, in, uh, been um, utilized you know, teaching instruction has changed, you know, drag, you know considerably. And they, the town has done the best that they can uh, to keep up and, and, and modify and adapt the school, uh, their, their classroom the best they can. But how do, we look, how do we even look forward, you know, 10, 20, 50 years down the line? What can we anticipate and how can we make the school adaptable for, for the future? So if you click it again, one more slide. This is what we call the chiclets. Um, it's really the, the, the kit of parts of the program. Um, and Joe's gonna walk through in, in, in the next few minutes a little more in depth. Um, but this is, this is pretty close to a final program. I think obviously with some input, you know, input and blessing from, from the, the board. Um, but these show the kit of parts of the school, all the spaces that are currently in the program to scale um, in relationship to each other. And as we're, we are currently developing and we will uh, continue to develop the three options, we start to take these puzzle pieces and implement them into the, into the school, into the existing school, um, utilizing that BIM model that, that Lauren talked about. Uh, Cause we want to show, really have a good understanding of the existing facility. And we want to propose solutions that will work uh, down the line. If, if one of those uh, renovation or the hybrid solutions is the solution that we move forward with, we want to make sure it's a feasible and realistic solution. Um, so you'll see these, these colored boxes uh, in the coming weeks start to take shape um, in the three different options. And um, we look forward to walking you through those uh, design options in the future. Mm -hmm. Joe? Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, as Dr. Jones mentioned at the start of this um, discussion, um, the project design really begins with the ed specs and really the ed specs really begin with enrollment. So currently um, we're looking at um, the following enrollment uh, for kindergarten through fifth grade about 320 students. And this came from the um, study, the master plan study and the enrollment study that was, was done by um, Statistical Forecasting Inc. I think it's the name of the company. Um, but added to that, uh, we're also anticipating adding pre-kindergarten, uh, uh, two classrooms for that grade of about 30 students. Um, in addition to that, we're also talking about or considering or asking the, the board to consider community connections for another 20 students. So potentially the Julian Curtis School would have a, a total design enrollment of about 370 students. And, you know, please keep in mind that um, these are simply in um, projections, uh, enrollment projections, uh, estimates of what's anticipated. There's several uh, new housing uh, projects around the particular area and, and around the town that could affect that. There's also um, the fact that this school is a magnet school and it draws from different parts of Greenwich um, and, and could significantly change its, uh, its, its attractiveness when the project is comp completed and you can have a lot more families um, asking to be enrolled in this particular um, facility. But the 370 student number is um, a very reasonable number and, and certainly a defensible number uh, when this is being brought to the state. Now the actual um, full up capacity will be slightly higher than this. You know, we typically uh, design classrooms for a range of space, uh, a range of, of students per room. And as, as we all know, the number of students fluctuates per year and per grade. And so you do want to have a little bit of headroom for those grades or for those years that the, the enrollment goes up slightly or you have a grade that's a little bit bigger than others and you can sort of balance out the, 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 the class with, with the rooms that you have. Now, um, Dr. Jones also mentioned uh, parity uh, and the new Lebanon Elementary School. So when we started looking at the program, uh, we did uh, study carefully the new Lebanon Elementary School uh, program and what was what was going on there and make sure that we were consistent uh, with the two schools. Um, however, I, I do want to mention that the new Lebanon Ed Spec uh, is dated uh, 2014. So that Ed Spec, uh, even today as we sit, is almost six years old. 
Uh, so do things do change and, and quite frankly, um, all schools are unique. Um, there's no two schools that are exactly the same and certainly Julian Curtis and New Lebanon School are, are, are very different and they have uh, a different cultural background. They have a different uh, curriculum. Um, so there's gonna be some, some differences in the ed spec, uh, um, certainly. So, you know, that's where really where we started. Um, and, um, you know, we spent a lot of time um, looking at uh, the school, looking at the programs and coming up with uh, the list of spaces that you see right in front of you. I hope, I hope everyone uh, can read this, this uh, chart. Uh, I'm not sure how big your screens are. I hope it's big enough that you can read it. But basically, this particular document is, um, is going to become Appendix uh, A of the of the ed spec narrative and when i refer to the ed spec narrative that's that multi-page um eight and a half by eleven written document that describes all of the spaces and and we've made some revisions to that just today after a conversation with dr jones and mr watson and so you should have that also uh, available to you but i think this particular document may be the best uh, to review very quickly with you and sort of, sort of give you a sense of what this is about and how it's organized. And I think it might be uh, very helpful um, to sort of walk through it. It's a pretty simple document. Uh, we've used this um, uh, on many, many schools over the years. And really it's, it's got four columns to it. The first column, well, well first of all, is organized by groupings. So you have different groupings. For example, the first one is academic. The next would be art, music, physical education, uh, world language, learning centers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first sort of column. It's the titles of the spaces. The middle three columns, which are labeled existing Julian Curtis Elementary School, are the actual spaces that exist in the building right now. There's one note uh, we wanna make is that the spaces that you see there are the average size of the spaces. Um, the reason why we average them is because there's always a slight difference of room sizes you know, for a particular use. And typically this happens in classrooms where you'll have a classroom that varies slightly in, in different size. And so what we like to do is add the square footages together, divide by the number of rooms and come up with an average. And that gives us a good sense and flavor of the size of the rooms. So for example, at Julian Curtis, the kindergarten rooms are just, just under 1100 square feet a piece. And we're proposing that they would be about a thousand square foot a piece. So it's slightly, slightly different. Our typical classroom size is about 864 square feet we're proposing about 860 square feet. So you'll see that they're very close. And, and, and the reason for that is there's a certain practical nature when you're addressing an existing building and you're looking at potential like new renovations. You don't want to really change the size of a room by 100 square feet because it's very, very difficult to do structurally. You try to look for some kind of reasonable, practical approach to uh, renovating the building. And quite frankly, 860 square feet um, classroom works pretty well, um, especially when you keep the number of children in the room uh, relatively low. You're not, you're not getting close to 25. You're not, certainly not getting close to 28, even though perhaps from a uh, union standpoint, you're allowed to. We're, we're not anticipating seeing that here in the, in the town of Greenwich. So you have a fewer you have fewer kids in the room. It's a lot more flexible. You have a little bit more space. So that's the, the sort of the first first chunk of space there. Um, Want to point out um, there's a couple of changes besides the pre-K, uh, you know, with the toilets. We are also proposing a discovery science classroom laboratory. It's not truly a laboratory, but it's, it's more of a, a space that's supportive of the STEM and STEAM program where, where students from all grades can go and do science. And that space is envisioned as a very flexible, adaptable space equipped with sinks along the perimeter, but no gas 
and you know nothing dangerous um, but a place where elementary students can get exposed to the protocols of science and do a broad spectrum of of, of different different things as a special and we think that would be a, a terrific program piece to have even at elementary school level. Certainly we'll promote and get them ready for middle school and certainly from middle school into the high school. So we think that's a very good um, component. The other one I wanna point out is the commons and the breakout spaces. You see that we have those, three of those at 150 square feet. And those are really in support of the academic spaces. And it's really uh, part of addressing um, small group instruction. I think that was one of the initiatives uh, in the master plan. And that's, and that's something that we're seeing more and more in our elementary schools, a place where uh, small groups of students can go to do some independent work or a student and a teacher or even teachers and teachers can go there and um, do some work. Generally, this particular ed spec does not change the number of classrooms per grade. We remain at three per grade, except for pre-kindergarten. We think that number works very well for the proposed uh, enrollment. It gives you a little bit of headroom. Uh, it doesn't overcrowd the room, and I think it works pretty well. The other component uh, we're working with is the art room. Um, and you'll see that the space is slightly larger. The, the biggest difference there in art is that we're actually allocating um, closed off spaces for art storage and a kiln space. I think, I think in your particular school, those may be out in the open and they begin to uh, hurt the efficiency of the, of the art room. So even though our art room is a little bit smaller in square footage, it's, it's gonna work a lot better when you have uh, 300 square feet for storage and your kiln space. Moving on to the next page, uh, music. Uh, the big difference here is that we're actually adding a instrumental music space, plus we're adding music storage and instrumental music storage. So those, those again, are support spaces that are overall going to help um, uh, the other two music rooms and work a lot better for your program. Another, another big change is physical education. And for this particular program, we're suggesting uh, that the district consider a gymnasium that can fit a full-size basketball court. And the basketball court is a standard 50 by 80. It's not going to be a competition gym, but we're thinking that this would be a, a space that, that could support a much broader um, uh, program and also can be divided down the middle with a curtain to give you two additional teaching spaces on each side for physical education. Hey, Joe, this is Tony. Yeah. Um, so some of the board members have an, another meeting that they're gonna wanna jump on tonight. Um, since we still have about 10 more slides, I think they're okay to go past some of this now they understand how it's all laid out mm -hmm. um, so that we'll have time for questions. Okay. So, so I think we can go ahead and move ahead. Okay, is that okay? I can just jump to the, to the bottom. Great. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll jump to the bottom line just to let you know what where we are square footage. And you have this also in in the PowerPoint I'm going to give to Michael. Oh. So when you add up all those square footage, uh, we talked about the existing building about sixty thousand five hundred. So the proposed new area. So all of those spaces that we just mentioned will add about eleven thousand. 600 square feet to the building, making the proposed program area about 72,000 square feet. And um, the, the programming effort um, really needs um, the board and uh, Dr. Jones's office to uh, you know, let, let us know if we're on the right track. And ultimately, uh, this is gonna have to be approved or at least uh, get a uh, sense of the body that it looks like we're in the right place. And then we'll take this and we'll uh, jump on onto the drawing boards and start creating some different options and show you how all of this would fit uh, on the site. At this point, I'd like to 
take any questions or answers. I know we have very little time and I know it's been a long night and probably a long day for a lot of us. Great. Thank you very much, um, board members. I'll just remind you to, uh, to raise your hand. Um, so this is Peter Bernstein. Uh, I'm going to kick it off. So for better or for worse, you've got two board members uh, whose kids have gone through Julian Curtis. So we, we know the school intimately and, uh, and I know Joe's been, been working on the feasibility committee. So I, I know you've done a lot of work with the feasibility committee. I'm not sure that they've seen this entire presentation yet. Uh, so I guess whatever comments you get from us tonight, obviously you can refine when you go back to them. Um, I, you know, for me, I, I, I never envisioned replacing the entire building and knocking it down. Um, it's sort of an iconic school structure. So I, I've always envisioned building onto the back and that renovation that you were talking about, um, basically combining the two, uh, moving some of the spaces around. And, and as somebody that's actually sat on a school building committee, uh, the most interesting and, and useful part of a feasibility study and the ed specs is to take that chart that you were showing and it basically becomes the roadmap for what's in and what's out in terms of construction. But one thing you, you said that you did, which I'm a little confused about, maybe you can help clear me up. You said you averaged the, uh, the room size. Uh, so I, I'm curious as to what the range is. I know in some of our buildings, uh, the range is, is vast, but, uh, but in other of our buildings, it's a lot closer. Well, I, I can answer that because I looked at those numbers myself. They're only a few square foot apart. Uh, they're incredibly accurate um, in terms of the area. So you don't have wide discrepancies. It's not like it's a couple hundred feet. It's really less than 10 to 15 square foot difference per every classroom. So they're really, they're really quite consistent. And that's, and that's really a, a function of the old timers building buildings by, you know, modularly. Gotcha. And, and that, that unfortunately is not true in all of our schools. <laughs> so no, just, just a, a follow up. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Give me one second. It's a senior moment, long end of the day. Uh, just in terms of, um, you kept referring back to new lab, I can tell you when the edu education specs were developed for New Lab, if you go back and you look at them, they're actually based on the Glenville School. And, and what the board was trying to do at that point was saying, this is sort of the standard that we'd like to get to across the district. Mm -hmm. So the, the 850 square feet for a, a classroom, you know, should be the goal that we're going for. But if the rooms are a little bit larger as they are now, I, I'm not sure if I see the utility in trying to shave a couple feet off of them versus modernizing the building. And as you said, making it ready for the next generation or, or 12 of learners. Uh, so that, that's really where I wanna make sure we're, we're spending our time. I think the common spaces for, for that building are a huge challenge. There's no ADA accessibility now. So that's, that's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. uh, air quality in that building you know, could use an upgrade and, and, and the list goes on, right? You've mm -hmm. got a lot of that addressed in there. Um, I just want to make sure that we're orienting towards the right things and, and not trying to make this a bigger project than it needs to be, but really, really working on those things that are going to have the most impact, uh, but maybe not maximize the cost. So. Yeah, we agree with all those points, Peter. I mean, we're very fond of the building. I won't, I won't lie to you on that. Um, but, you know, I think, it's, I think it's worth a study for a new building, see where it comes out. And there, you know, there may be some folks that, want us to pre prepare that. So I think it's important to at least look at it. I guess I'll just follow up uh, by saying, I believe the reimbursement from the state is more if you do a, uh, a, a, a fix than a, a new building, but maybe I have that backwards. Well, that's true because what happened is a few years ago, they reduced the um, reimbursement percentage by 10% for a new building. All right. Well, then maybe uh, maybe, <laughs> they, repair, maybe repairs the way to go. Yeah, um, they they snuck that in past everybody when they weren't looking. Let me let me call on uh, on Joe Kelly, the other JC Parent alum on the board. Hi, Joe Kelly here. Uh, Peter, I you touched on the points when I put my hand up. I was going to elaborate on this, a lot of the same points you made. Uh, Definitely the community wouldn't tolerate, the JC community would not tolerate the replacement of that building. They would be in a, uh, very upset with that because there's a real fondness of those who went to that school. So we have to really spend a lot of extra time making sure we try to preserve that building. If you can't do it, you can't do it. 
uh, if the uh, uh, the other option is to uh, uh, to build another school, then you know we got to have to do what we have to do. But we certainly don't want that to be the primary focus. We also have to understand what are we going to do with the students while we're working on or renovating the building. So that's obviously a challenge we have to look at as well. So yes, most of the points I was going to make, uh, Peter, you had said, and I do. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reconfirm that the, there's uh, many of us were very fond of that building. All right. Are there other board members who've got questions? And I guess while they're uh, raising their hands, uh, Dr. Jones, I'll just ask. Um, so the, the plan is to go back with this to the feasibility committee and have some more discussions, right? This is very early in this process. Yes, that's correct. We'll go back to the committee because what, what has happened now is taking that new Lebanon ed spec and putting it against what's actually in JC so that we know we've covered all of those areas. Um, and that'll, this whole thing will go back to the committee again before our next meeting in April. Great, thank you. Ms. Downey? Um, yeah, so I just had two questions. All right, so for the process, which is sort of part of it. So we talk about it tonight. It goes back to the committee, then it comes back to us, and then how do we go forward from there? That's kind of question number one. So once it goes back to the committee, assuming um, the committee looks at it and they feel like it's, it's met, and, and if the board is in fact saying uh, that we still want to commit to what was in New Lebanon, um, and the board will make, you know, we'll have to weigh in again, whether it's tonight or our next meeting about light community connections and pre-K, and I'm sure we'll hear from the community as well. When we come back again, it can be on as an action item, and if the board's ready, just on the ed spec. So, and I want to really reiterate that because this is not about design right now. This is a feasibility study. Um, we've asked for the design money in next year's budget. So this is to get us primed and ready to know what is it that we actually are go going to do. Um, so whether that's at the April meeting, the May meeting, but we need to get the actual ed spec approved um, so that we'll be ready to actually you know, get the RFP together and get started hopefully you know, July 1 if, if it's funded. Okay, and then the second part of the question, okay, so that explains the process. In terms of the issues about pre-K and community connections, when is the time for the board to have this discussion or is it the, for the feasibility to talk about kind of how do you envision that process? Yeah, this is really a board, this really is a board of education decision. Now, certainly we get input from the committee, which we, I've, we've already had that. I'm even talking to the principal about having pre-K in the building, uh, whether or not, um, you know, that would be a good thing. It's a Title I school, just like New Lebanon was. Um, so following that kind of same frame of thought, um, but like community connections, again, getting feedback from the committee, but it really comes down, does the board want those two items in the ed spec um, or not. Um, Peter, do you want us each to opine on that at this point? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I was waiting to hear others, but I, I'm happy to have you start that off. And then uh, and Karen's got her hand up. Yeah, you know, I mean, personally, I, 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 I'm in favor of, of pre-K because I think it's an important, uh, so many studies have shown the importance of early education. And I think from a consistency, Point of view, we would like to be able to offer that at New Lebanon. So I would be in favor of that. In terms of community connections, I think I'd need to see more information because it seems just on the initial glance a little odd to have an elementary school with a group of older students and whether there might be a better way to put them at the high school um, where it's a more age appropriate, I don't, which is also centrally located. I, I mean, I know they're in a building right near Julian Curtis now, but I'm not sure that's something, it's, it, it feels like an apples and oranges to me in terms of mixing things um, in terms of student populations and what makes sense for us. That, that, that's just my initial feeling on it. I'm sure other people have a lot to say on that, but I'll let them do so. Ms. Hirsch? Um, hi, um, I, part of my questions were actually asked already, which was um, you know, what the process is, because there are a lot of um, items that were added to these as a possibility for ed specs, like pre-K, community connections, some of the physical spaces within the building, things that we hadn't really addressed or looked at to make sure that there is, again, parity across the district, but more importantly, um, you know, funding and other 
ideas going forward. Um, so I know Christina sort of asked those and I guess the question is when we can add some of these as a real discussion item to get input from, you know, the community and whatever on, on some of them before we make any decisions. Um, but I guess the set, two questions that I had were, or one question I had, and then I'll discuss pre-K and community connections was um, looking at the proposed uh, building areas that you were adding which is you said around 11,000 square feet, so a little over 30% of the current size of the building. Mm -hmm. I just was wondering if you t took a look to see um, if we have enough FAR for that or if that would need to be applied for a variance to add that type of square footage. Uh, the short answer is I think that the site being the size that it is can certainly support the FAR. Um, there is some question whether or not the baseball field is part of the Julian Curtis site plan itself or if that's a separate parcel. We're trying to find that information and so that we can determine the F FAR on the, on the site. Okay, um, and I guess in reference to uh, Chairman Bernstein's questions regarding thoughts on pre-K, um, much like Christina, um, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies on the importance of early childhood education. Um, I would definitely be interested in exploring the idea of adding more pre-K, but I guess I know that our pre-K program is also based on the, the need of the, from the community um, for students with learning differences. So I think we should kind of look at that before we decide on adding more, um, even though I think it's a great idea. And much like Christina said, again, with community connections, I think we need a little bit more information and detail on how that would be placed there. I know, for instance, when there was a discussion of moving elementary school students to be housed on middle school sites, parents were highly even concerned about having elementary school students mixed with middle schoolers. I can imagine they would be concerned about having elementary school students with um, you know, high school or high school aged and older students uh, on the same site, um, unless, it is this, unless it's built in, but it's a separate space, which I think uh, would be a discussion we need to have. I'm not seeing any hands up. I'll just weigh in on uh, pre-K and community connection as well, uh, waiting for the other board members to weigh in. Uh, Pre-K, I'm all for, uh, for looking at building out the space. Um, I know we have questions about how many sections we want to have and where we want to have them, but I think including the space is actually a really important thing. As to community connections, uh, I still never understood why they were moved out of the Millbank building and we've moved in, I think, some special ed staff. Uh, who potentially could be placed in a building, uh, therefore giving community connections its own permanent home. I'd really like to see a permanent home for them, but I don't think inside an elementary school is the best spot for that. Um, all right, I see Mr. Kelly's got his hand up and then Ms. Olson. I would be uh, concerned about community connections uh, being part of the elementary school, uh, but the pre-K seems a natural fit. All right, Ms. Olson. Uh, same here. I've always been a big pro proponent of, um, you know, early childhood education. So I would be more interested in looking at the pre-K and in terms of community connections. Um, again, I have some concerns about them on the same campus, but also just uh, probably need to understand more about it altogether um, beforehand. Ms. Kowalski, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in as well. Yeah, sorry, Peter. I'm trying to figure out again how to wave my hand, but it wasn't working. Um, I am um, with respect. I, I share the this the sentiment on the continuing connections. I think it'd be nice to have a location that they could call their own. I have some skepticism as to the how best it works uh, in an elementary school, but obviously not drawing any conclusions and open to having uh, information and you know community input on. Uh, their views on that as well and whether or not that makes sense, but I do hold some reservations as to that working. Um, as to the pre-K, I look, I, I think we need to, we need, we certainly need some more information about it. Um, I think it obviously makes sense to build this building uh, for the purposes of a long term, which may make sense to include the space, but I think we also need to look at it from a budgetary perspective you know if we're continuing to add pre you know additional pre-k what does that do to our budget yeah particularly because um you know pre-k in large part is uh has been and is used 
uh, for uh, you know, early education for those that either have a special needs or are financially constrained, which I have no issues with, but we need to look at it from a budgetary perspective on how large we can expand the pre-K program, um, just simply based on money. So we need to look at that as well, and we'll need to have those figures when we make that decision. Thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing Mr. Scherer as a participant anymore, so I don't know, Peter, if you're on. I don't think he's on anymore. All right. Oh, Ms. Stowe. Hi, um, right on the two issues, community connections, I think I have the same sentiment initially as the rest of the board, but um, don't want to make a decision without having a little more information in front of us. And um, I think Karen raises a good point on pre-K. I do think that it's important always, and I'd like to build the building with that in mind, because you never know where we will be in 15, 20 years, and I, so I wouldn't want to be a penny wise, pound foolish, and have to retrofit the building in 20 years. Having said that, from an operations perspective, I wouldn't want to commit to anything at this time in terms of expanding the program because who knows where we're going to be going with our next few budget cycles. Fair point. All right, so Dr. Jones, uh, do you think you have what you need from us to, uh, to keep moving this forward? I do, thank you very much. All right, great. Okay, with that, uh, we will thank our friends uh, who presented tonight and uh, thank the Feasibility Committee. Joe, thank you for serving on that and all the hard work that's gone into it. Um, you know, look forward to continuing to talk about this. And uh, with that, it brings us to agenda planning. So this is the uh, fun part. Um, it's sort of a little bit of guesswork. Our next meeting is scheduled for April 22nd. Contrary to the newspaper, we didn't really cancel our last meeting because it wasn't a meeting, it was a professional development session. Uh, but we do have a meeting scheduled for the 22nd, uh, which I would suppose we'd, we'd keep uh, for that evening. Peter, um, it's the 23rd, not the, the 22nd. The 23rd, sorry. Yep. Not to interrupt. Right. I'm looking at the old calendar. Um, so just, uh, just thinking ahead, right, we can, I don't know if these either of these items would be ripe for, uh, probably not ripe for action that night, uh, although the entryway seems to be a little bit further along, um, but you know, Dr. Jones, uh, we, we can talk about that. Uh, I know Peter wanted to do, and he's not with us now, uh, a little bit of sort of forward thinking. I don't know, uh, you know, we could do that, continue to do that as part of the superintendent update, uh, or, you know, just, uh, just take that up separately. Um, some of it may require policy changes. So Kathleen, I might, you know, maybe you ought to take a look at that. I mean, if we're going, if we're going to have people, and I, I've not heard that by the way, uh, that people might want to redshirt their kids. That's the term for it. Uh, so, you know, maybe we can look at what our policies uh, have already. Um, but I don't know if there's anything else anybody wants to add to the agenda. You know, we're certainly still moving forward with anything that requires our immediate action. We'll keep putting on agendas. Uh, anything that would involve a deep discussion that we'd all want to be in the same place for, uh, we will continue to hold until we can get to that point. Ms. Stowe. The only thing I would say is that maybe we'll, we'll have to probably consider adding a meeting or two if, for whatever reason, we're told that the school year is going to extend. Um, I mean, sorry, and earlier. And if, that, if that's the case, you know, and we find that out on Thursday, I'm not sure we want to talk, wait until April 23rd to have a discussion. So. But you know, I guess we'll we'll know more this week. Yeah, we can we can always add a uh, a meeting. You know, we don't love to do it on short notice. We did this. Uh, um, we were hoping to hold this meeting later, uh, but I had to be reminded that I've got a religious holiday Thursday night, um, so I couldn't do it later in the week, which is why it feels like it was short notice. So apologies for that, but uh, we also couldn't do it Friday. That's Good Friday, uh, so we're working against the calendar. But yeah, we can always add a meeting. Um, you know, our meetings are generally about every two weeks, but if we need to change that rhythm, we will. So, you know, obviously as news comes out, Dr. Jones has been doing a great job keeping the, uh, the community engaged. Um, with that, uh, Joe, I don't know if you had a motion you wanted to make? Just so happens I do. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Uh, before you do that, I had my uh, hand raised about the agenda. I'm sorry. Okay, Ms. Hirsch. Um, on our agenda for the April 23rd, we have a discussion on the strategic plan with the strategic plan update. I don't know if that's just in regards to stuff because our committee has not had the opportunity to meet 
because yeah i think given the fact that we uh basically at the last meeting mr Sher basically you know said we probably would not move forward with that work right now obviously there's other priorities so i think we would not take that item up at the 23rd unless there's something that absolutely needed to be reported out and again we're going to go through that list because i'm looking at it right now there's a textbook recommendation if that's something that is something that requires board action we you know we would take that up so uh, yeah. you know dr jones uh Ms. Stowe and i will uh we'll put our heads together and look at the agenda and move on those items we need to move on but i don't think strategic plan at this point is going to be one of them as, as mr Sher identified at the last meeting thank you that's why i just wanted to see if i needed to bring it up now no problem i swear i heard I'll, mr Ke i'll turn it right back over to joe now mr kelly i, he I heard you say something uh well karen say something now for hold your peace motion to adjourn all right. Uh, I'll I'm second gonna, that. All right. She seconds that. All those in favor, we're going to do a roll call quick. Me? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Ms. Downey? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Kowalski? Yes. Ms. Olson? Yes. I believe Mr. Scher is still absent. That passes 7 0. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate your attending and, uh, and, and listening in and participating. Thank, Thank you night. very much, Mr. Chairman. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.